Thank you. My name is Reed Blakemore, Deputy Director of the Atlantic Council of the Global Energy Center. Um, and I think I was just given the best introduction to my panel I possibly, possibly could have, because this is the issue that we're kind of building towards as we think through moving away from uh, Russian gas to a more energy secure, diversified energy system, these issues around uh, what the clean energy supply chain looks like, how we think through issues around economic leadership, value chains, friend shoring, reshoring, and what recent uh, policy initiatives have uh, helped us build uh, or at least begin to build a more constructive, diversified, and secure clean energy supply chain. And of course, when I look to what uh, Amos Hochstein spoke about the, uh, this morning, and that the real lesson from Russia's invasion of Ukraine is uh, the need for a focus on energy supplies and en diverse energy supplies as a way to ensure energy security. Uh, I, I, I think there is a profound question to be asked as Europe moves into a clean energy supply chain, one that, uh, frankly speaking, is, is, is thoroughly dominated by uh, China throughout the upstream, midstream, and uh, for certain energy technologies, the downstream consumer side as well. How you think about not moving from one single source supplier into another is, uh, is, a, is a huge problem for us to answer today. Um, and so to that end, I'm pleased to welcome uh, a really fantastic group of uh, panelists. We have Joshua Vols, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Europe, Eurasia, Africa, and the Middle East in DOE's Office of International Affairs. We have Deborah Kagan, a Senior Advisor with the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center, uh, as well as a Distinguished Fellow in the Transatlantic Leadership Network. And then we have John Roberts, uh, a non-resident Senior Fellow with the Global Energy Center here at the Atlantic Council, and shortly we'll be joined also by Frank Fannin, uh, a Managing Director at Fannin Global Advisors, and also a non-resident Senior Fellow. Uh, at the Global Energy Center. And I think to kick us off, you know, John, I, I'll turn to you first, which is really, are we looking at a world uh, as Europe aggressively accelerates its clean energy deployment with an eye to diversifying away from Russian gas, are we looking at a world where it's becoming more dependent on Chinese supply chains and does that present its own risk, uh, both economically and geopolitically speaking? I will address it, but I'll give you a short answer first. Yes, we're looking to that kind of a supply chain, but I'm not sure about the level of risk involved, and I'll try to go into it. First thing, look at Europe. One result of the Putin's invasion of Ukraine is quite simply an acceleration of the move towards an energy transition. Indeed, it's probably better to talk of it as an energy transformation. At the moment, we have a scrabble for gas and indeed for other fossil fuels, but that is of limited time frame. We don't know whether it will be needed beyond next winter, and next winter could be critical, or whether it might extend one more winter beyond that. But the trajectory after that is downward for gas. Essentially, Take a look at the IEA's projection. 1.7 trillion investment last year, this year in clean energy against 1 trillion investment in conventional fossil fuels. And investment in clean energy pays off quicker in terms of commercial return than investment in fossil fuels. So it's going to have an impact fairly quickly, all this rapid, massive change towards in investment patterns. But let's take it from the Chinese perspective. China's not like Russia. What is Russia to the rest of the world? A source of energy and a source of armaments, but not much else. What is China? The manufacturer of the world. China needs export markets. And if you look at China right now, its GDP growth, which we in the West would consider very healthy, is not considered healthy by Chinese standards. Possibly a GDP growth rate of 3%. And with a zero increase almost in population these days. So that means China wants export markets 
and export markets need export routes. And the Chinese are no fools. They may be able to develop a good relationship with Russia that suits them on the energy front, and indeed on the strategic front, but it isn't a good export route, let alone a good export market. So they've got the long maritime routes, or an increasing interest in the middle corridor. So let's go along the chain of the middle corridor, boosting relations with Central Asia. Curious, they're not developing relations with Turkmenistan in terms of energy imports, anything like as fast as they were expected to do 10 years ago. Look at Azerbaijan. What does Azerbaijan want to do? It wants to be the heart of the middle corridor. It has conference after conference on the subject. But what's it actually doing in the field of energy? It wants to put in 4GW, 4 gigawatts of newly installed renewable power. And it wants to export a lot of that to Europe. Curious, though, lots of problems concerning it, but I'll make one point. Three quarters of that is wind power. One gigawatt onshore, two gigawatts offshore, and just one gigawatt, one quarter, solar power. So the solar power will have to rely very largely on China. But is there any reason to believe China will not supply Azerbaijan? No. As long as it has capacity to do so, which is a key issue, of course. But wind power, wind is very largely self-centered in Europe. Not totally, but basically it's a home-produced, domestic-produced product with equipment for it. So the next thing is, if you're going to be Azerbaijan, how in heaven's name are you going to get equipment into Azerbaijan? Because you can't use the Volga Don, Don Canal for that. Essentially, you're going to have to build an industry yourself from scratch. Possible, but difficult. So I am not optimistic about Azerbaijan being able to do anything quickly on renewables and electricity, let alone on conventional fuels. So I'm more or less saying that there may be something that comes, not least into Turkey, but all the potential is there is going to take five, six, seven years to develop. It's not something that's going to happen mm -hmm. quickly. And this is the one thing I want to say about Azerbaijan. It's been a reliable partner. It's delivered what it would like to deliver, and it has major resources. But there are massive problems on timing with anything it is suggesting to do. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem for the European Union when it comes to dealing with the Caspian. Because in all sense of purposes, it's essentially Azerbaijan with which it has to do. If there was one change I could wish for, though it doesn't concern Azerbaijan, it concerns Georgia. Georgia has phenomenal hydropower, great potential for electricity exports, but the principal source of that hydropower is in practice shared in terms of command and control between Russian forces and Georgian operators. So it's not really available. But if Ukraine were to triumph, one just wonders whether the situation in Georgia might also change a bit. You know, I'll end that. I appreciate you offering some, uh, you know, 
some initial nuance into how we perceive China's role in that in in this in this supply chain that's emerging, and that you know China does need export markets. Uh, you know, I think you can look at Chinese solar. Uh, capacity building and see that it does need a place to eventually put all the solar panels it's generating. Um, but nonetheless, I think the what we've seen in the discussions over the course of the day is, you know, you do need to find a way to avoid this problem of single source supplying. Mm -hmm. um, and so, Deborah, I might I might turn to you then in terms of, you know, given that we likely do need to think through a multitude of possible suppliers, a multitude of possible supply avenues in order to think through a resilient clean energy supply chain. How should Europe, uh, either at a you know an EU level or at a country by country level, be thinking about increasing the diverse the options it has for that diversification? What are the what are the pros, cons, and, and various opportunities you see on that front? Well, thank you for having me here today. It's better this august panel was just that more august. Than the <laughs> so, um, so a, a couple of things, and I want to step back first. Um, there were many of us um, bell ringers going back to 2013 and 14, warning about Nord Stream 2. And I'm sitting with, with two of them here on this and about uh, the lack of diversification, about putting your eggs all in one basket, about um, don't, why do you keep trusting the same person and think the outcome will be different this time? And, and so they went forward with Nord Stream 2. It turned out to be the disaster that uh, all of us here thought it would be, um, and we're not gloating over it because it was, you know, it was it was trenchant, it was terrible, and it took a lot of time to overcome what the issues were. Um, and so now, when we're watching Europe um, develop its future for clean energy, um, and the look toward China is to me the same mistake all over again. And, and, I, and, I think, and I think this is an issue not just for, uh, for Europe, if I might say, it's an issue for the United States. And I'm thinking of the, uh, the new EV um, factory that's being built in Michigan, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Chinese Communist Party. I, I think these are mistakes. Um, I think that you know, in, in, the, in the military parlance, we always like to say that in, in nuclear safety, you have this one point safety. You don't want to depend on one system to back you up. You need redundancy. And it's ridiculous in this day and age when we see the necessity of you know, energy supplies that we would go down a path again of depending on a country that has proven itself time and again, not just a strategic uh, a strategic adversary, but you know, really can be a military adversary as well. So this does not make a lot of sense, and we should have learned something from COVID. We should have learned something from Nord Stream 2 about putting your supply chain in the hands of one country. Um, the, the second thing I want to talk a little bit about is, um, I, I, you know, for fear, I won't mince words. I call this the supreme arrogance of the West, and that is, there are ample resources in Europe and in the United States in terms of rare earth minerals. In fact, I think it was, and correct me if I'm wrong here, gentlemen, but I think until 1986, the US was the largest producer of rare earth minerals on the face of the planet. And then there were fallouts following um, Jimmy Carter's presidency and the like when the, you shut off the plutonium reactors and you stop digging in mines for rare earth minerals and the like. And what you get is what we have today, which is a ridiculous fight over producing copper in Arizona. And, um, and, and there are places in Europe which also have the same issues where there are rare earth minerals that can be exploited and can be exploited in a fairly safe and ethical way and we're not doing it. And I say arrogance because I believe that people in the West somehow think that their geography and their people are more sacred than people who live in other parts of the world who are indentured servants, who are forced to work in these mines, um, who live in substandard conditions. And I, I say arrogance again because 
we are sitting here, and the thing I work on every day is this war in Ukraine, and we talk about our common values, our common ethics, our moral high ground of what Russia and China are trying to do to the world. And yet, we turn around and say, we're too good to develop our own resources in our own countries, to mess up our own backyard geographically, and to sully our fingers with digging this stuff out of mines. So it's best that someone in another part of the world do it for us because we're somehow more deserving. And it is something that I find incredibly irksome. And I also find it sort of analogous with the view that there's 1.3 billion people on the face of the planet, most of them in sub-Saharan Africa, who do not have electricity. Yet, we sit here and say, you just have to wait another 10 years till we get you adequate renewables. You shouldn't have electricity now. And, and ironically, you have progressives pushing this, and the people most hurt by this are women, uh, because they're the ones who have to burden um, getting all of this done in those countries. Mm -hmm. And so I, 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 I'm not going to speak very long on this, but to use today's parlance that I think has been overused and abused. but. This attitude is what I think is rank colonialism. It is this somehow that we won't exploit our own domestic resources because there's a part of the world that doesn't need to be looking as good as we do and their people aren't as good as we are. Mm -hmm. I think that was several incredibly important points, Deborah. I, I, what I want to do is uh, I want to turn to Frank to kind of finish a little bit of level setting and map the playing field for us and then Deputy Assistant Secretary Voles, I want to come back to you and talk about how the U.S. is seeing both its role in the supply chain, but also you know its partnership with uh, Europe in terms of building a more resilient supply chain. But first, Frank, you know what got us here? I think is a, is a useful place to start, both in terms of uh, you know the the what Deborah called the arrogance of you know um, understanding our resources, using our resources effectively, but also. Uh, what got us here in terms of China's incumbency uh, in this space? And, and how does understanding those two features uh, allow us to more effectively map a path forward um, as we think about these issues around supply chain diversification? Yeah, do you want me to use that too? Or can I just I think it? we can. Uh, all right. Well, all right. Great to be here. Mm -hmm. uh, so how did we get here? Um, big question. Um, you know, look, the, the United States was the leader in the energy transition before it was a thing. Uh, the United States is the, is the country that helped develop the electric vehicle, the country that first developed the solar panel, the first country to, do, to, to optimize the integration of some of these systems. But uh, that was more than two decades ago. And uh, we, see, we, we, we walked away from the field and allowed for China to come in and become the manufacturing and integrated clean energy supply chain powerhouse that it is today. So it's, it's something that was, was uh, I don't think, necessarily purposeful, um, but, it, but it had the same result. Now, but we, we approach the China question and energy transition from fundamentally different value sets. The United States is seeking to do it for two principal reasons. Uh, locally, it's because people want you know, cheaper energy, clean energy, and that's good, cheap and clean. That's what people seem to like. Um, it's rational. Um, but more broadly, in terms of a policy lens, it's to address climate change issues more broadly. Okay, well then, China, by contrast, their motivation is not to address climate change or environmental quality, or as Deborah spoke about, concern about human rights, liberty, environmental protections, and the normal conventions that we in the West ascribe to and hold dear. Their objective is security to cut itself from reliance on the U.S. Naval Protectorate for sea lanes. They want to by cut that off. And in so doing, they become this manufacturing powerhouse. And they've done so. There's a playbook that China has developed to look at the solar market uh, and how they've stolen IP uh, from the United States. And that's not, you know, it's well documented. But if you ever want to see something interesting, FBI, Google FBI China threat, amazing website. Uh, and they have a little movie, super high production value. Um, but it goes into some of these issues. It's fascinating to see the corporate the CCP corporate sponsorship of, of, of IP theft in the United States. This is very real and it's been long standing. So what, the question is what are we gonna do about it? Um, 
so what, what happens in the solar industry? They, they created this industry. They had an overcapacity. And then uh, Europe, principally Germany, said they started they had a green agenda. Okay, so they were moving forward. So China started exporting content to, to Germany, principally, but Europe more broadly. And then, and then boom, uh, Fukushima happened. You had an exogenous shock to the system um, uh, that the German government decided that they're going to cut off nuclear power overnight. And there was a supply overhang of, uh, of, of content. So it started flying into Europe. And now we are where we are. There's, this is a playbook. Now, apply that to, solar, to electric vehicles. Again, cut off oil is the objective. Um, they created this uh, supply side vertical integration. Um, China, of course, mobilizes Belt and Road and other debt diplomacy models. The Army actually has a mining company. It's not the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and, and they go into places, and they say it's time to move, and people move. Uh, and they exploit the resource. Uh, they vertically integrate this based on stolen IP. And then they also don't just have supply side. They also have coercive demand side policies. The last several years, in order to get an, a license plate in the outer Beijing area, you would better drive an EV, or you're in the lottery for the rest of your life. So they, they're, they're playing. Uh, both sides of this. They build up this overcapacity and actually have some decent quality stuff. Um, then what happens? Dieselgate, Volkswagen. Volkswagen immediately says, we're going we, to pay for our sins. We're going to go EV, and we're going to do it tomorrow. And here we go. There's a pattern here in this oversupply. Now, I start looking at some of Europe's gigafactories that are building. Something like 30% of the EV battery manufacturing capacity in Europe through 2030 is Chinese owned, 30%. So um, you know, as we talk about this issue about creating a responsible, secure supply chain and this question of shared values, I think, and Deborah spoke to this, we have to reconsider this. I think we're entering into a very practical era of economic real politik, which we have to reassess traditional allies and see if there's a degree of of compromised uh, parties. And so I think the free trade agreement structure under the Inflation Reduction Act is a terribly crude way to go about doing things. Um, the issue shouldn't be whether we have an FTA agreement. The issue is should be effectively a China test. Um, and again, the IRA provisions aren't there to prohibit content from coming to the United States. It's whether the US government will subsidize it. The US taxpayers will subsidize it. You know, Ronald Reagan said, uh, if you want less of something, tax it. And if you want more of something, subsidize it. Uh, we say we don't want more Chinese content, but there was, there's potential that we could unintentionally be subsidizing the very thing we dislike. Um, and this is playing out very, in a very real world. I mean, I've worked on advisory boards for various companies now in this space. And there are con companies who are seeking to set up effectively shell companies, uh, pass-through entities in free trade agreement countries to kind of a launder, if you will, otherwise prohibited content in order to benefit from US uh, taxpayer subsidy. This is really, really problematic. And so um, I think the administration, the US government, the, we all have a, an opportunity uh, to in, incent a degree of real competition, which is otherwise lacking. Um, which requires both degrees of transparency and uh, posing some hard questions to our friends and allies. Thanks, Frank. So, Deputy Assistant Secretary, I think this these three sets of comments, you know, tee you up well to talk about. You know, the administration has made a number of different areas of headway into thinking about the resiliency of these supply chains. Uh, you know, starting from what I think is, uh, we would all agree is. Um, a level of consistency across different administrations with some, you know, concern about s supply chain resiliency in the critical mineral space. And uh, this administration has advanced those, uh, those, pr those ideas in tangible ways, the IRA just being one of several venues. When you look at the, the transition that is happening both domestically in the United States through energy transition, the attention that's being paid to uh, both you know, enabling and protecting U.S. industry through diverse, secure supply chains, but also how that same transition is happening on an accelerated basis in Europe uh, in order to diversify away from uh, Russian hydrocarbons. You know, what are your thoughts on how the United States should be a productive partner 
to Europe in this space? And what can we look to see next from the United States to advance some of the ideas it's already put on the table? Well, thanks, Reed. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I, I see in the audience no less than three or four people that I used to work for. And uh, so it's, it's always a treat the, to, uh, to be with old colleagues. But um, you know, I think first and foremost, I, I want to kind of acknowledge uh, something that Frank said and something that Deborah said. And they, kind of challenges and some of the real pit, potential pitfalls we see in addressing the supply chain issue that has really come to the, the fore in, in recent years, but has been a problem for many years previous to this uh, before we really started to address it in a coherent and a comprehensive way from a policy perspective in the U.S. government. And number one is, you know, we do, we are potentially opening ourselves up for uh, significant Chinese uh, infiltration uh, through back doors and loopholes uh, to take advantage of the, the very legislation that we've put forward to try and accelerate uh, the transition and to bring the cost of these technologies that are crucial to the energy transition down. And as a result, we're, we're working through uh, a set of regulations through the foreign entities of concern uh, process that will do exactly what uh, Frank was talking about in terms of screening the type of investments that are coming into the United States. And this is not this is a little bit different than what we do with, uh, with our CFIUS process as well. And it is primarily focused on addressing the Chinese threat and the Chinese uh, investment angle in these critical sectors. Uh, what Deborah said in terms of uh, where these minerals are located and the rarity or perhaps lack thereof of rare earth, rare earth minerals, um, you know, we, I think I see that in, in, in a slightly different light and I really see the opportunity that we have uh, to partner with uh, a number of the countries that are rich in these uh, resources in uh, sub-Saharan Africa specifically, uh, but we need to do so in a different way. There needs to be a different model of partnership, and what we need to do is we need to help our African partners uh, increase the uh, level of access they have to capital to, uh, to make, the, make sure that they have access to uh, alternative investors uh, if we don't show up, if other, if other folks don't show up, if our European partners don't show up to invest, they're forced to go with the only other alternative, and that's China. And they say that repeatedly to us. We would love to partner with you, but you have to show up. Your, country, your companies have to be here. And so I think that's one of the biggest problems that we need to face uh, from a, a kind of a holistic approach is how do we incentivize and create greater opportunities for Western, Democratic, European, Euro-Atlantic uh, commercial interests to invest in those spaces and to do so with all of the values uh, that Frank talked about that, that, that we as a country bring to bear in, in, in the commercial sector. The other thing we need to do is we need to help our partners where these, a lot of these resources uh, are located move up the value chain. It needs to stop being a sole extraction process and we need to help them use those resources to extract greater value for their own populations and to, to, to raise the standards of living uh, for their people. Because at the end of the day, that's what, they, that's what they want to do and that's what they need to do. And so while it is a challenge, and while I think we should be doing more domestically, I think the opportunity exists to significantly shift the way that we see partnership with mm -hmm. uh, a number of these critical allies. And the angle that we need to uh, you know, approach that through with our European partners and allies is to do so in, in concert with them. This is a, a very complex Gordian knot and to untie it, to think that we can un and untie it on a bilateral basis or country by country, I think is, is, is a little bit naive. And I don't think there are any of, the, you know, we don't have command economies. Mm -hmm. And so we cannot mobilize the type of capital that the Chinese can mobilize to just make those command economy decisions. So how do we do that in partnership with our European partners and allies? And how do we do that in partnership uh, with the areas that, uh, that these critical resources uh, exist in? Mm -hmm. The energy transition is something, you know, I think we're all, we all agree on the direction that we need to head. There may be different reasons that we're heading in that direction, but I think the direction is clear. And when you have things like electric vehicles requiring six times as many rare earth elements and minerals as a normal combustion engine, or a, uh, an offshore wind turbine requiring nine times as many rare earth minerals and critical minerals as a combined cycled uh, gas plant, uh, it, the problem is clear. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the only way that we're gonna be able to address it is, is through partnership, but a new model of partnership that, that brings in the private sector and the public sector in a creative way. We need to make sure that we uh, are enhancing opportunities for the, for the private sector, not getting in the way. And, and that, that's 
you know, a function of the right balance of regulation and legislation, but also the enabling environment uh, and the de-risking that the U.S. government can play to some of those investments that are, uh, that are a little bit more of a challenge at this mm -hmm. point. I'm struck by, and with an eye to, you know, the remaining time we have left, and I'm frankly mindful of the fact that we're keeping our audience, uh, we're the panel between, you know, a reception, so which means there's extra <laughs> pressure on us. Um, but I, I'm struck by this tension that's emerging over the course of this panel, which is the, the commercial realities of a, of a globalized supply chain, right? And the fact that, John, as you put it, uh, China, you know, it needs exports market, markets for a lot of its goods, um, and it's looking to engage commercially in this space versus, I think, Frank, what you pointed out, which is the economic realpolitik, right, of the energy transition as we see a, a generational transformation in what economic leadership looks like. I think to close us out, I'll, I'll ask each of you largely the same question, which is where within that debate do we find ourselves now, or how do we navigate that dichotomy between the commercial realities of a, of a globalized supply chain that has already been in development for some time versus the, the, uh, the economic realpolitik that uh, is, is not only defining, you know, the energy transition opportunities, but is also has a, is being pulled by the need to diversify, again, in a European context, diversify away from a single source supplier in the form of Russia. And I'll start with John, and we'll go one minute responses just to make sure we, we close on time. Rare politic, UK dependent now potentially on China for nuclear. God help us. Secondly, we got China out of the Huawei, China's Huawei out of our phone system. Mm -hmm. Thank God. <laughs> so you've got two big things we've done. Mm. One, one we've done and one in the wrong way, completely, with nuclear. But the biggest rail policy, frankly, is going to be showing that Taiwan will be defended. Mm. That's a political rail policy. If that is not clear, why will China listen to anything we should say or do in terms of economic action? Mm. And lastly, the point I made about Azerbaijan, I do think it's right to have some commercial contacts with China still. That's my element of the balance. But it's not on the big things. And yet I am aware the sheer mass of reliance on rare earths, and I very much agree with what Deborah was saying about our willingness to put what we used, to, what I grew up knowing as the third world, in peril, in indentured servitude because of our greed. And I think mm -hmm. the classic point is that when I grew up, you saw these big dams in Africa who served everybody except the immediate populations around them mm -hmm. who would continue to live. We are in danger of doing that with rare earths. And somehow we need to partner, as was suggested, for developing rare earths, but also simply for ordinary energy security to develop them when we have them in our own backyard. Certainly agreed, and I think you, you pulled out two important threads there. One, the item of the, the criticality of, of sharing value with our upstream partners, but also I think uh, in your nuclear example that there is variance between various uh, clean energy technologies, right, in terms of how we assess risk, both in terms of the market penetration of a given technology, but also the mineral and component needs of that. Uh, Deborah, a last word from you on this balance between uh, commercial relationships and economic realpolitik. We don't need to call it economic realpolitik, but it is the almost the grand strategy element of, of what we're dealing with in relation to these supply chains. Two, two things, John, John touched on them. First of all, I think what Josh is saying, what I'm saying, are not mutually exclusive, and they don't have to be. But, and, 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 and John raised this, so I'll just jump, I'm sorry, John raised this, so I'll jump right into this, which is um, when you realize that a simple Javelin, a simple Javelin weapon system has 32 computer chips in it, mm -hmm. all of which contain rare earth minerals, do you really want to depend on China for the U.S. defense industry to do what it has to do, or the European defense industry. And I think that's a really critical point here. And mm -hmm. I think, and, and you mentioned Taiwan, and you mentioned defense of Taiwan. 
Um, do you want to depend on China for your computer chip technology for your weapons that you might have to use in a fight with China? Um, and I'll leave it at that. No, I think you brought a huge point. So many of the issues we deal with here are closely related to uh, the semiconductor supply chain as well. These aren't just supply chains related to the clean energy technologies. Um, Frank, thoughts from you on this balance that we're yeah. talking about here. Uh, what I'd like to revert back to is what is our comparative advantage? I was said before, you know, it's not that we're the biggest industrial policy, as some, some people like to talk about industrial policy. We can't out-China China. That's just not the structure. What our comparative advantage is is, is, is the, our, our, our liberty, our uh, ingenuity, entrepreneurship, and the scale uh, and ability of our private sector and, and capital markets. The challenge I see is, is, is twofold. One, scale of the transition. Um, last year, the oil and gas industry uh, was valued globally at $4 trillion, $4 trillion. Goes, goes down, goes up based on oil prices. But last year was a, a good year in the oil business, $4 trillion. Um, by contrast, the base metals business, base metals is far bigger than the very narrow set of critical minerals, um, is valued on a global basis at about $550 billion. Um, we're, we, would, we would suggest to transition away from something that's very small, and we spoke, heard about the minerals intensity, that there, there would be, given this Given this huge transition, it sounds like a pretty darn good investment opportunity. Is capital responding? The last year uh, of public figures, uh, the, the minerals exploration budgets of the mining industry was 13 billion. Uh, the oil industry, by contrast, uh, you know, we're proposing policies to curb the demand for it, was at $500 billion. Clearly, capital isn't keeping pace with policy. Why? Why is because uh, markets, you know, supply, demand, price discovery work to the extent that markets are free and transparent, and they're not, and China likes it that way. China is the swing producer, the, dom the dominant supplier, and there's complete opacity in how they, they run things. And this is, this, is, this is the crux of the matter. How do we mobilize our comparative advantage? If China's in control, we need to incent proper, real competition, and that's to apply the, although modest but significant uh, provisions such as the IRA and other uh, programs to deploy properly, uh, you know, based on, on U.S. and true allied uh, partnerships. I think a critical point, deploying our, our comparative advantage through governance, right, and thinking, making sure we keep governance front of mind. Uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary, offering you the last word here, either on this dichotomy we're, we're pulling apart in this, uh, in this panel, or uh, general thoughts on what you see as the path forward for the U.S. and Europe on these issues. Yeah, thanks. I, I, I think Deborah's absolutely right. This, these, these issues don't have to be mutually exclusive. And I agree with Frank as well. We have to play to our comparative advantage. And what is our comparative advantage? Our ability to partner. If you ask anybody in the world, say it be perhaps Russia, China, and a few of their uh, you know, acolytes, they would prefer to partner with the United States on just about any of these issues, full stop, flat out, no question, no consideration needed. What we need to do is we need to make that partnership option more viable for them. Because at the end of the day, it has to also make sense economically. And we, there's no way that we're going to be able to do it exclusively from a policy perspective or a regulatory respect perspective. The transition will never be able to be financed on the balance sheet of sovereigns alone. So how do we reimagine the partnership between the public and the private sector to bring together the various pieces that we need to counter the weight of the Chinese mm -hmm. in, this, in this space? And so that's where that partnership opportunity lies, both with you know, the suppliers and, uh, and with our partners in Europe, which will be you know, major off-takers of these resources. All right, well, I think that's, frankly speaking, a, 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 you said the phrase a Gordian knot was used over this panel, and we managed to try and start untying it over the course of 40 minutes, so I just think we deserve some credit for making an attempt there. Uh, certainly more to unpack on these issues and more. I'd like to thank our panelists for joining uh, me this afternoon on this critical issue, and uh, let's give them a brief round of applause. And, and now I'd like to pass it to uh, Senior Director of the Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center, Landon Durrance, for uh, some closing remarks.